Hey everyone, thanks for attending today's uh, roundtable conversation put on by the Digital Signage Federation. Today our topic is what should I look for in interactive technology? My name is Ryan Cohoy with Rise Vision and I co-chair the education subcommittee for the DSF and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Uh, today the topic is all things interactive. So we're going to talk about hardware and software and content and all the things that you want to learn about uh, for interactive experiences. And we want to keep this an open and lively conversation. So um, we do encourage questions. As you're watching the video, in the lower right hand corner you should see a green ask a new question um, button that you can hit and throw your questions in at any time. And if you see other questions coming in that uh, you want to vote up, uh, feel free to vote those up. We'll um, definitely try to spend uh, as much time as we can answering all the questions that come in. If for whatever reason you don't see that ask a new question button there, uh, look towards the top of your video and there's probably a little uh, icon with nine dots on it. And if you do that, it should allow you to open up a Q&A app. Open that up and throw your questions in there. If for whatever reason you're having problems asking questions through the, the video window, we will moderate the Google events page as well. So there's a box right below where you started this video that says say something or say anything. Feel free to throw your questions in there. And again, we, we definitely encourage your questions. We want to make sure we uh, direct this conversation into what, what interests you most. Uh, if you haven't been out to the Digital Signage Federation website in a while, uh, I'd encourage you to check it out. number of great resources, some uh, industry market vertical guides, uh, photos, case studies, you name it. And we're always looking for more content. So if you have any photos, examples, case studies that you'd be willing to share, please send them over to us. We'd love to get them out on the website and share them with the greater digital signage community so that those resources are out there. And again, all that's out at digitalsignagefederation.com. Um, also, if you're interested in following more of these types of events, our goal in the education community is to try to do two of these events a month. So there's a calendar out under events. Um, we've got another one coming up April 22nd where we're going to talk about using touch screens for donor walls and honor walls, those types of applications. So please check out the events, participate in them. Uh, if you are interested in possibly being a speaker, sharing your story, or you've got ideas, um, I'll throw up some web addresses here in a, or I'm sorry, some email addresses here in a moment to um, you can send those thoughts and ideas into. Um, today we've assembled a, a, a great little panel here to talk uh, all things interactive. Uh, first is Jim Nista from Insteo. He's going to talk mainly from a content perspective about how you can make these displays really engaging from an interactive perspective. So um, he's got a lot of experience over the years putting together a whole range of digital signage uh, applications, but we're really going to tap into his thoughts about interactivity today. And then also joining us is Vincent John Vincent from Gesture Tech. Uh, Vincent's been in the industry for over 25 years now. Gesture Tech's one of the pioneers in the space and uh, you know, can share with us all of his experience putting together a lot of really wild and unique interactive experiences, uh, not only talking software and content, but specifically about hardware, because I believe Gesture Tech holds a, a number of patents out there for this type of interactive and engaging content. Um, again, my name is Ryan Cohoy with Rise Vision, and I'll, I'll moderate the conversation today. Um, I did put my email address up on the screen. Uh, again, I'd encourage anybody that has feedback on these Hangouts or has ideas for future ones, email me. I'd love to hear from you so we can put that into the pipeline to you know, make these as meaningful as possible for the, the greater community. And also on the screen I've thrown up both Brian and Jerry's email address from the Digital Signage Federation. If you have ideas you'd like to bounce off them, you know, they're, they're heavily involved in the programming and planning for this. Um, but also if you just want to volunteer and get more involved with the Digital Signage Federation um, or just join if you're not a member yet. Reach out to Brian and Jerry. We're, we're always looking for more people to help uh, create awareness and, and make things even better for us in the, the digital signage industry as a whole. Uh, and again, uh, really encourage questions. We, we want this to be a, a very lively conversation, so please hit that Ask a Question button. Uh, again, if you don't see it, look for those nine dots at the top and open that QA app. Uh, we, we definitely love to hear from you and, and direct the conversation accordingly. So uh, with that, uh, go ahead and get things started here. And I'll, I'll start off with you, Vincent. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your involvement in digital signage and interactive projects, your, your company. Give us a little bit of background and, and context about uh, yourself and Gesture Tech. Sure. Uh, so I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of Gesture Tech. And Gesture Tech started about 30 years ago 
uh, when we, uh, after we essentially invented video gesture control and the whole basis of the company was trying to be able to allow people to interact with displays using their full bodies from a distance, uh, looking at different ways uh, that people could interface uh, with the display. Uh, the initial technology was actually an immersive, seeing yourself on the screen and interacting with the animation that surrounded you. But over the years, we pioneered all sorts of different arrays of gesture control, uh, from pointing at the screen, uh, from just uh, motion detection, from uh, multi-touch, and, and various types of applications. And essentially, have delivered those in some 7,000 installations around the world. Uh, so that's it's basically uh, uh, what we're still doing at Gesture Tech, pioneering and moving uh, video gesture control to the next level. Excellent. That's great. Well, I'll throw the same question to you, Jim. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're doing over at Insteo. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, the CEO of Insteo. We are a uh, content development company, so we do um, uh, custom creative content and uh, a lot of data-driven work. Uh, we also do interactive work, wayfinding, um, just a lot of different solutions that uh, are, you know, whatever clients are, are looking for to kind of have a successful project. We've been doing this for uh, 12 years, so been in the business for a while. Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, let's get things started talking about uh, some of the, the key questions people have out there. Um, you know, I'll start with you, Vincent. You know, when somebody comes to you and says, "I want to create an interactive experience or an interactive project," that's a very generic term. How do you get them started? Like, what are some of the questions you start asking to help define that and you know get into the requirements of what they really want to do? Yeah. So I think. The number of the different types of things I would want to know is um, what's the location, what's the environment, um, what's the size of the display, are they looking at uh, having an interaction with an individual or a group of people, uh, is the, the content meant to be navigated by a single person and or you know a group of people, uh, and is it a... Um, is it a branding experience that they're looking for, or is it actually a navigation of content? And that's going to really depend on the type of interactivity and uh, basically the type of um, experience that is going to be delivered in, in, you know, to their clients. Great. Does uh, size usually impact the technology you start to steer them for? Like if they say they want to fill an entire wall versus they're looking at something smaller? Like uh, how do you nail that down? Yeah, when it when it's we're talking about interactivity versus just viewing a large display. Uh, if it's going to be for a group of people, if it's going to be a, a really large display, uh, to to take in and see the whole display while you're interacting, um, you might need to have people stepping back far enough to you know where they can actually see the entire display. Because um, obviously displays are getting cheaper, they're getting bigger. We're starting to look at you know video walls and, and huge projection. Uh, so if if that's the case, then the interactivity is likely going to be done with some kind of gesture from a dis distance. If it's more about uh, you know 55 inch screen or a 60 inch screen, uh, then it may come down to the fact that uh, you want to have them right up close and they're they're doing something on the screen, touch screen. Okay, great. I'll throw the same question at you, Jim. You know, what are some of the questions you ask to help narrow down the scope and what people are looking for when they say, you know, just a broad stroke term of interactivity? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty goal driven. So um, when a client is is uh, begins to ask those questions, and you know, they they they've uh, decided that they've seen something somewhere else, or they've, uh, they've they've seen some press release about something, and usually driven by that, then we start asking what their goals are. Um, and that's an initial very important question because it has a tendency to lead us into a very step-by-step -step process for us, um, which is going to be driven first by content. Um, you know, so if their goals are they want to create a massive immersive experience along a 40-foot uh, wall, um, you know, that drives everything, that conversation very differently versus they want to have a 55-inch uh, touchscreen um, that shows a list of donors or a list of, uh, of other people. So. We, we focus first on goals that drives us into content, and uh, other things like hardware, software come a little later in the conversation. Uh, so it is a, a very uh, important kind of step-by-step -step process for us to, to understand what it is they're really trying to accomplish and, and uh, ask them a series of questions about, about those, uh, those goals. Uh, what do they want their visitors to experience? I'm just curious, are you finding that you primarily have that conversation initially with the end user themselves, or are there consultants, architects, AV integrators in the middle that uh, are helping to navigate that? It is a challenge for us sometimes in that um, sometimes a project comes where uh, 
those initial important steps for us are going to be um, And that, uh, that means that sometimes uh, decisions have already been made about hardware software solutions that are maybe a little premature. Um, and so, uh, you know, the end user is the one who's going to understand what it is they want a uh, visitor to, to take away from an experience. And um, with interactive solutions, there is some sort of experience. There is some sort of, of drive behind it. It may just be that they're looking to uh, make sure clients understand where to go, uh, visitors understand where to go with a wayfinding project. It may be that they're looking for them to take away a memory, some sort of memorable experience that um, really helps them kind of connect to that place when they were there. And so uh, we do, we have seen some projects come along where some of those important things were bypassed and then we steer everybody back. And the end customers generally understand that and uh, the integrators are generally going to support those, those understandings. But it's all driven by visitor experience, guest experience, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be that visitors, what it is that, that, um, that everyone wants them to experience by interacting with that screen. Great. Um, well, let's let's jump into the hardware side of things first. Um, I'll start with you, Jim. Uh, you know, when you're looking at it purely from the hardware, when you're when you're getting those goals and you're helping them try to nail down what type of hardware is best, where do you start, and what what advice could you give to somebody that's maybe just starting out with uh, looking at interactive, going, you know, where do I start from a hardware perspective? Yeah, it's so driven by the project, right? So, um, you know, it's a um, uh, in terms of of exactly what technologies are going to be driving all of this is going to be driven by the project. Uh, we have a interactive project in uh, our shop right now that is small screen based. Um, so you know it's, um, it's that's driven by the project. It's driven by the scope um, and space that's available in the retail stores. Um, and so uh, it's going small screen based, and that's going to come back around to us and and uh, and understand what it is we can and can't do. So, um, you know, hardware is going to come back with, you know, for us, it's always going to be a secondary uh, decision after we've understood exactly what, what the, the, those goals are and what the environment allows us to do. Uh, in terms of, like, what excites me in terms of, of, of hardware is sometimes touchscreens have, to have a tendency or interactive experiences based on touch technology or gesture technology have a tendency to be a one person at a time. Um, and uh, it's really nice to see certain things coming along that also involve mobile. Um, so where you can actually make the screen do things um, by touching your smartphone. Um, and so your smartphone is web connected to the screen and making things happen. So from an excitement standpoint, if somebody came to us, which doesn't happen too often, but it happens and it's nice, and says and, and has that, I want to do something cool, but I don't know what to do. Um, we might start to t take certain things in those directions now that some of that technology is maturing um, around creating an interactive experience where you are integrating the mobile device that everyone has in their pocket with the screen. And um, not to say that we don't want gesture or we don't want a touch screen or we don't want anything else, but that may allow more people to interact at the same time as opposed to uh, a few people. Now I know with the gesture technologies, you can have many people actually interacting with a very large screen at the same time, which is really, really cool. Um, but when you're talking about maybe a 40-inch, 50-inch touch screen, only one person can use that at one time. Sometimes that limits the experience. Great. Um, well, perfect. Well, let's uh, throw the same question over to you, Vincent. Uh, is, is looking at it purely from a hardware perspective. How do you start? What advice do you give people? Where should they begin? Yeah, I think it... it uh, I agree with Jim on a lot of his points. I, I, I think it all comes down to what's the nature of the engagement. You always want people engaged, but how are you trying to engage them? Is, is there, there to be an experience um, that is more of a natural user interface experience? Is the engagement more through the content? So when, when you look at what is going to get delivered, there's a number of ways to deliver you know, that kind of engagement. It, it's, it could be uh, literally you know, a, a touch screen, multi-touch screen. Uh, that people are, are, you know, close to, they're interacting. It could be very large. It could be a, a matter of a, a very long wall touch screen where multiple people can walk up to that same wall and, and do uh, their navigation interactivity on that wall together. Or it could be stepping back and, and allowing people to point in control of that. It could just be a matter of if it's, if it's more on a, a branding level that they're actually walking 
uh, past something. It could be a window, it could be a wall. Um, it's just about them having that engagement by interacting and, and sort of paying attention, uh, not so much a navigational experience. And once again, that could be on the floor. It, it, it could be a table. So you've, you've got vertical and you've got sort of horizontal types of signage that people could interact with. And you really want to find out what that is. And that's really going to drive the, the, the hardware uh, behind what you're going to do. Are you, are you really looking to um, you know, take the size of the display first and then take the nature of the interactivity and uh, drive it with that? One of the things that I see talking to various you know, touchscreen providers is it's all about points of touch. You know, oh, we've got 10 points or we've got 32 points of touch. You know, boiling that back down to when you're helping somebody implement something, what does that really mean to a user if they've got 32 points of touch? Is it important for them? Well, I don't think it's that important if you really just got a single user who's using a 40, 50 inch touchscreen. It's really when you're talking about groups of people interacting together that the amount of touch that's available uh, becomes important. If you're uh, a single user, it's it's going to be somewhere between one to six touch points. You, you might do more than just two, uh, but unlikely you're going to be doing anything beyond six. But if you've got a group of people, then of course you're going to want to have as many touch points as, as are available. And uh, once again, that's that could be on the screen or it could be off. So we often do things with gesture control where there are multiple people that can interact and they can point in control or a single person can do, you know, um, multi-touch with their, their two hands from a distance uh, using cameras or uh, we're doing it on screen with uh, any number of different types of um, multi-touch hardware. That could be using cameras if it's a really large display. It could be, you know, a, um, a projected um, IR overlay, it could be a capacitive, it just depends on, on the size, but uh, uh, the amount of touches really are the number of people and the nature of the engagement that you're wanting to uh, get those people. Okay, great. Well, let's shift gears, let's talk about software, and I'll throw this at you first, Jim. Um, you know, what, what are some of the keys to software uh, when somebody's coming at this and you've nailed down the goals? Where do you direct them from a software perspective? Yeah, well, there's uh, there's there's two sides to that. There's the um, the development software um, for creating an interactive experience, and then there's the the control software that's going to keep that screen going. Um, and sometimes that might be a CMS. There might be some other solutions out there that that are really not necessarily a CMS, but some sort of kiosk software to kind of keep that under control. So um, in the first side, development software. Um, there's really kind of two approaches to that. There are some actual very mature tools for creating uh, interactive experiences um, that are um, uh, designed around kind of reducing the amount of code you might have to write um, and kind of creating a bundled experience of um, certain tools and, and features available to you to create touch experiences. And some of those are very mature and you can do a lot with them. However, um, Oftentimes we find that there are some limitations that we start to bump up against. The client is asking for for a lot of different things, and they're asking for essentially custom development. And the custom development side of things may be custom code in HTML5. Um, it may be uh, we don't do a lot of flash anymore. There are some other companies out there that still do that type of work. Uh, but those types of tools are um, actually writing software code. So a lot of interactive experiences are actually custom software code because what the client's looking for doesn't exist. On the, um, the management side of the screen, uh, that might be a CMS um, that is uh, you know, keeping the screens going, reporting information back to you, allowing you to upload those experiences to the screens. Um, or it may be um, a kiosk software, software intended to kind of control the, the, the computer so that people can't get out of it. And, into Windows or whatever else. We have to remember that all the time is that we're essentially giving the user control over the PC or media player that's there. Um, if that media player is, let's say, uh, just a digital signage of clients that doesn't do anything other than digital signage, it's probably going to be there not to go do anything. But sometimes they might be a Windows player, and we're actually giving them mouse control. And so um, there's a lot of, uh, we've seen this happen numerous times where there's uh, special uh, on-screen sequences to, to get out um, into a code, to get into Windows, or 
um, which just they're running a full screen browser, which we've seen as well, and people have been able to, to kind of hack. You know, I use that term lightly, but just accidentally in some cases getting back to to the operating system. So um, the control over the software, over the uh, media player itself, is extremely important when you're dealing with adding touch because uh, there's just we see it all the time, and probably all of us have seen it walking through an airport or whatever else. And somebody's brought up a, uh, an interface on a touch screen that shouldn't be there. Um, so it's really, really important to make sure that that device is locked down completely so that that can't happen. And there's a couple uh, applications out there. In addition to just most CMS uh, software, um, don't uh, you know? Don't allow you to get out. I know that there's some content management systems that if you can get to the escape key. Right through an on-screen keyboard, you can get back to the desktop of Windows, and that's sort of those are things that that always have to be taken into consideration. I know there's some that you press the uh, the top right, left right, bottom right, lower left, or whatever else. You press a sequence, and that brings up a code. And there's supposedly some code out there that's the standard code. I've seen people doing it at hotels at uh, digital signage trade shows, and say, "I know the code for this one," and everything else. And so it's just. So be, care, be, be really careful with that and keep those new devices locked down once you start adding touch. Makes sense. Also, the same question to you, Vincent. Uh, what's your perspective on software and anything to add to that? Well, I think Jim's covered it actually quite well in terms of the, the nature of the different ways that to approach it and obviously some of the problems that can come up uh, if you're not paying attention. I think we've been obviously doing this for quite a while, so we've uh, in the when we're doing things that are gesture based we've actually developed a lot of proprietary uh, gesture based engines that are either putting your full image on the screen and you're seeing yourself as as part of the content uh, and being able to interact with that content that surrounds you or um, just uh, you know combinations of different types of um, effects engines that when we're either doing the content development ourselves or we're sending our systems around the world, we want our, our clients to be able to rapidly develop uh, applications that um, allow them to either take our templates or um, you know, create from scratch what they're doing. So uh, we have a series of uh, you know, if effects that can be alpha channeled over each other. People can build up uh, the types of uh, more gesture controlled interactions where it's more about motion based. Uh, when we're actually doing things that are uh, more navigational, uh, where it's about either pointing control from a distance or touchscreen, I think a lot of Jim points, Jim's points, you know, are really what the direction we go in as well. There's a lot of different software out there. Occasionally, we're we're having to do something custom, uh, but um, it's uh, it's you know, these combinations of either uh, HTML5 or uh, Flash. Um, Sometimes we're moving into Unity 3D, where if if the actual experience that people are interacting with is this kind of hybrid between what would be normally touchscreen navigation and and some kind of uh, virtual world, and um, where you're getting more 3D uh, experiences as as part of what you're navigating through. Just curious, are you seeing a trend more towards HTML5 and those tools, or are you still seeing a lot of proprietary tools creating this content? Well, I think. For ourselves, it's we're still doing the majority of our work with uh, our, our proprietary tools uh, when it comes to gesture control. Uh, when it comes to the multi-touch, yeah, I'd say there, there's there's certainly a uh, a movement between towards more HTML5. Okay, great. And just a quick note about that. Um, uh, I think it's important, and I didn't bring it up, is the, the idea behind uh, using game development tools. And that's what Unity is. Um, there's a lot of these kind of uh, app and game development tools out there that I think um, some of the better content shops are starting to kind of just basically leverage. Essentially, you are creating something like that. And um, and so uh, that's when I mention these kind of existing tools, sometimes it is that these uh, uh, development environments for, for rapidly deploying things like uh, games or, or game apps um, are basically targeting the hardware that we're already using to, to drive this, already have all the touch, already have all, all these um, uh, interactive layers already built into it. So a uh, great, uh, great solution as well is to actually work with them. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's move to the million-dollar question. Let's talk about content. You know, that's 
really what makes a good interactive experience. So I'll, I'll start with you, Jim. Like, what are the keys to good quality interactive content? You know, I, I know we've talked a lot about the goals and those pieces, but you know, how, how do you help people define those goals and get started down the right path? Yeah, at the, at the end of the day, it's just that if, the, for example, the goal is for someone to have a memorable experience, um, it might be very different than if a um, uh, the goal is for somebody to have to get from point A to point B. Um, so, so good content achieves the goal, and um, it, it's it's really hard to to kind of uh, um, it's hard to kind of define good content any other way other than there there's a uh, a goal to be achieved, and if you've achieved that, if you said hey we we need to get people with a wayfinding solution which can be interactive from point A to point B. Um, uh, that's that's done. On the more memorable experiences, so the larger things uh, that I know um, uh, Vincent's been talking about as well. Um, good content is is really a idea around um, creating an experience. Um, I know engagement is a popular is a very popular word here, and it's a very important word that the user is engaged. But that memorable experience, the idea that they're taking something away um, from that. And um, you know, it's really kind of a, an important situation when you see a, um, a very large touch installation not be utilized. And you have to start asking yourself some questions. What went wrong with that? Um, and then when you see those that are being taken advantage of and people are using them, it's because they are inviting. They're immersive once you are invited into it. They're intuitive. They're, they you know, understand how to use it. Um, and those, those types of things are really um, important. We don't want to have to have somebody um, uh, have to read instructions in order to approach it, uh, an interactive uh, screen and begin utilizing it. It should be extremely intuitive. They should understand exactly what to do without even doing anything. And it should be inviting, welcoming them over to say, hey, come on, let's get involved. Um, and so those are really, really important things that can kind of define good content for us um, and uh, just making a great experience. Do you think that that content um, really should be coming from, I'll call it, digital signage focused companies? Or do you think just any old web designer that they're already using for other advertising or web uh, projects they're doing within their organization can make memorable content for a, an interactive display? Yeah, I think in, in a very, very large agency settings, uh, the agencies can adapt. They can understand uh, and learn and have the savvy groups of people there that are going to be able to do that. Um, the reality is this, is that is a digital signage is a com combination of broadcast and motion graphics. So there's an there's a, there's a aspect of it that's related to um, creating video and motion graphics content. There's an aspect that's computer programming. There's an aspect that's graphics, that's just static uh, graphic design. Um, Having, uh, finding that in your average kind of web developer or game developer is not generally there all the time. Um, there may be missing one of those aspects that is important. So as digital signage content agencies are starting to really kind of become more popular, and there's some really great ones out there, um, and uh, you know, that's basically what our company does as well, um, they're understanding a lot of these these rules that apply only to digital signage that really don't apply to web development or game development. That isn't to say that a lot of those same functions and features, and, and there's not a lot of overlap there. It's just that there's a lot of different disciplines that go into digital signage. So the, I think what we've seen is that the best projects, the most, the ones that win the most awards, the ones that win the most industry recognition, are coming out of digital signage agencies or in collaboration with a very large interactive agency that's used to creating apps or used to creating games and collaborates with the digital signage agency and learns some of those things that they might not have uh, uh, learned from just creating a more single experience on a smartphone or tablet. Okay, great. I'll throw the same question to you, Vincent. Uh, keys to good quality content. Yeah, I think Jim's covered a lot of it, but I th the other aspect of engagement is uh, sort of the, you know, how things are unfolding, what you're discovering. Uh, it, it can't be uh, simply in terms of whether it's, uh, you know, 
gesture engaging or even touch screen, just a simple like touch a button, move to an, another image, like static images. There's got to be, as you said, sort of motion graphics, things unfolding in a very artistic way, things that can be interacted with that are, um, you know, engaging you while you're doing it. So whether that's objects that you can, um, you know, shrink or grow or spin or uh, look at from different perspectives, whether that's as you're interacting, having effects happening on your interaction on the screen. Everything you're doing with interactive digital signage, you're, you're doing with your hands versus what you might be used to on your own screen at home doing with a mouse. So uh, the types of things that you can do with your hands are a little more dynamic uh, than what you would do with a mouse. So you would expect to have some kind of experience that, that is a little more dynamic in that way and that um, it's, it's uh, you know, using your hands to uh, you know, navigate through as opposed to just touching, uh, touching buttons as, you, as you're going through. And then, of course, um, you know, with the types of things that we're doing with gesture control signs, you can be a, a lot more engaging because you're, uh, you know, you're in that particular case, if you're using the whole body, you're not necessarily asking people to navigate through content, but you are engaging them by allowing them to interact dynamically with objects that are going to move around the screen and uh, uh, have different types of effects and interactions as, as you move and use your whole body. So. Um, it's really, you know, comes down to different forms of engagement, but you're, you're wanting to make sure people are engaged. Uh, as Jim's saying, it's about getting them to the goal. So if, if it's about navigating through to make sure they're getting the information well, the, the simplicity of that, making sure that there's no learning curve. If it's about engaging them with some kind of natural user interface where it's gesture-based, um, you want them to feel natural and, and feel that they can uh, have an effect, but there it's not anything that they need to do that's complicated or that whatever they do is it's going to have a sort of a, a positive end uh, uh, effect that where they they've seen they've done something that that uh, is pleasing. So the the other aspect of that uh, Jim mentioned earlier in an earlier question is uh, the difference also with. Uh, you know, people not just interacting with a single screen, but dual screen. So when you're uh, engaging people to to jump between their own mobile device and the the display that they're they're interacting on, uh, it, it's obviously got to be something that's very simple, very t for them to understand or do. Um, in some cases, they're doing their interactivity on the main display, and and it, it might be something around purchasing where they they jump it to their their own mobile device to 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 finalize uh, some kind of exchange of information or, or, or actually uh, some kind of purchase. When it comes to gesture, um, you know, we've got systems now where we get people engaged with their mobile devices with the ability to uh, upload uh, some kind of content to the actual display that's in front of them and allow them to interact with the content they've sent. And that could either be their own, their own pictures, their own videos, or it may be an app that they have on their phone that allows them to choose between various animations and, and what effects those will have when they're sent to the screen. But it's, it's about making sure that that's a very simple process for them to be able to engage, you know, both with the, the main display, but also with what they do with their, uh, their mobile device. Perfect. All, all great information. Um, I just want to remind uh, our viewers to uh, please ask questions. Uh, you know, there's a little green ask a question box in the lower right hand corner to fire those questions in um, or via the Google Plus page if you want to throw anything into that say something box, uh, we'll, we'll moderate from there. Um, we did just have a question come in, um, really good question. You know, the, the users noticed that there's a lot of interactive displays that lack physical customer engagement. You know, in a, in a busy environment, how do you gain the user's inter, uh, attention to get them to come over and interact with the display? Um, so I'll start with you, Vincent. You know, how do you bring people over to the display to get them started interacting? Well, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, obviously, call to action somewhere on the screen. A lot of digital signage is broken up into to various frames um, where, where there's different information on it. Uh, having some kind of call to action on that that is on the display that 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 asks people to come up and, and interact, or it may actually be just stickers or, or static signage in the area uh, that that gets them to be aware that this is interactive. We, uh, obviously with what we do, we have a bit of an advantage in that we can use a camera and have you see yourself on screen, see yourself engaged actually in some of that content. So we could take one of the frames, 
uh, one of our systems, the Screen Extreme, lets lets you us put your color image on the screen inside the graphics. Uh, you're interacting uh, with, you know, in a just a more motion-based uh, way as opposed to navigation. And then there can be a call to action to, you know, that gets you to see the display and realize that there's some kind of dynamic to it and interactivity. And there could be a call to action to uh, to come up to the screen and touch it to, to get further information or to navigate. Or if it's uh, then gesture-based, it's a call to action for you to be able to point at the screen and, and navigate that way. So that there's a number of different ways. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's important that how you engage the user um, is that whatever their interaction uh, that you're getting them to do first is simple and you kind of guide them into uh, more complex actions so that they don't come up and, and right away can't figure out the, the display. Uh, that's the worst thing that can happen is, is to, for them to just look at it and, and think it's too complicated. Uh, Makes sense. Jim, anything to add to that? Any interesting uses you've seen of ways to engage people to come over and start interacting? Yeah, you know, it is an interesting fact of you can have all this investment, uh, all this investment in technology and, and creative and everything else, and just kind of strike out on uh, the call to action side, not asking for somebody to come over. Um, and uh, some of the things I've just seen are just kind of you know, video loops saying, "Hey, you." <laughs> Right, just kind of that type of direct outreach to people um, that is just uh, a, a very simple creative solution as opposed to adding more technology to this. So, um, you know, it is it is quite odd that that we've seen some misses there that um, that that um, that are there, but it is really something that it really does in fact have to kind of reach out and grab somebody fast um, and, uh, and and do it in a in a direct ask kind of way. You can't really insult anybody at that moment. You just have to say, "Hey, come on over, Dark Knight. Let's let's uh, let's do some stuff together." And um, uh, you know, with with other things like wayfinding, whatever else, it's not that much. I mean, they're they're, they're approaching the screen because they they're trying to accomplish something. But if it's come play a game or something like that, you really need to kind of reach out a little bit stronger. And sometimes it's a, a, a identifying the reward a little bit better. What's in it for them? Um, those types of things in that call to action, but yeah, it's really unfortunate. We have seen that times where the call to action is the the downfall, um, the most simple thing that you would think of, which really causes the, the the whole project to just not get utilized. Yep, it's kind of interesting. I've seen screens lately going through airports and other places that have stickers on them that say "Please don't touch the screen" because they have the opposite effect. Everybody assumes it's a touch screen, and then they're tired of cleaning all the fingerprints off of it. Um, so let's uh, let's shift to cost, which is always the big question on the tip of everybody's tongue. And I, I know it's really hard to nail down without knowing scope and goals and project and everything else. But you know, Jim, I'll start with you. Like when people just come up and say, "What does an interactive experience cost?" How do you guide them? Like what what's kind of a range, or how do you point them to something to nail it down? Yeah, you know, a lot of it has to do uh, obviously with scope of project, which you mentioned, um, but. Uh, well, we're going to start asking the questions back to them, you know, um, in terms of goals and budget. And in doing that, we can start to kind of understand a little bit better about, you know, what's realistic and what is it. Uh, these projects can, you know, uh, other types of projects like other types of digital signage, like designing menu boards and things like that. They, as, as long as you're not doing an original video production, you can really easily kind of put together a price for motion graphics work. With interactive. Um, the project could go into the millions in terms of uh, what you're building from a from a uh, interactive experience. It could also be, uh, you know, a hundred times less than that, um, depending on again what you're trying to do. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that there are some very simplistic interactive experience software programs that are starting to come out now um, that are just kind of pairing this all the way down to a much more simplified, you know. Um, uh, you know, wave your arm and tick the soccer ball through the net uh, kind of thing. And, it, and the coding is all done, and, and, uh, and, and as long as the client is okay kind of staying within the parameters of, of what motion detection and everything else that's already there, uh, they can actually kind of keep that, that project within a reasonable budget by utilizing a lot of solutions that are already existing. Um, we don't 
we do find that, that that can happen from time to time. We also find that immediately we'll get the, um, I love it, it's perfect. Now can we change a lot of it? And um, and so that ha has a tendency to happen often is when we, it's, it's initially, this is perfect, this is the right solution. And then as we start to explore and discover a little bit more, we realize that there are some limitations that the client is looking for um, expansion of that. But there are many cases where, where we're seeing those types of very simplified, very fast experiences. You know, throw those so the, the football um, to the receiver kind of games, those types of things um, uh, that take 10, 15 seconds to actually interact with and you win some type of reward, um, that those can be very, very cost, uh, uh, you know, efficient, just really cheap projects that, that still create an interactive experience for the, for the visitor. Great. I'll throw the same question at you, Vincent. How do you uh, narrow down costs, like when people are asking you to just give me a number? Yeah, it's obviously really hard to do that because it it is about what's the experience going to be and what's the size of the displays and how much content are they really thinking through. And it really varies in terms of both you know, cost-wise, in terms of the size of the display, the, the amount of content cost by, by how um, deep or dynamic that content might be. Uh, you know, we have systems that we see, you know, so if someone's just looking at a kiosk, I'm, I'm sure that they can look at getting that kiosk, uh, you know, somewhere between a, a five to a $10,000, let's say it's a 55 inch to a 60 inch kiosk um, for, the, for the hardware, but the content that they're going to develop, um, you know, maybe the same amount or, or you know, even larger. It's, it's really, um, a dynamic scale as to how much uh, your content is uh, going to cost by how how rich it is. Um, but uh, in in some cases, with our some of our gesture control displays, it's uh, you know we've got a basic system. We're able to you know give them a price that um, you know is everything sort of like let's we'll just say you know the the projection, the uh, computer, the you know the the installation, etc., uh, and then they might just use our templates and be able to do like small logo drops or, or changes to that, and that's that's good enough. And uh, you know they'll they'll end up somewhere between uh, you know a, a ten and twenty thousand dollar cost, but they could come looking for um, a whole you know idea of, of what it is they'd like to do, and it's involves very rich content, it involves, you know, multiple projectors, it involves a video wall. Uh, those are going to change the dynamic of, of what you're going to deliver in, in costs dramatically. Perfect. <clears throat> well, um, let's talk about what's the coolest thing you've seen lately. I mean, we're just coming off of DSC. You guys obviously travel around a lot and see a lot of different applications. I'll start with you, Vincent. Uh, you know, what's the coolest application you've seen lately using interactive technology? Um, I guess the only thing I could think of is is what um, our clients have driven us to do that is that has been very cool that sort of pushed us into new areas or new realms. Um, I think the uh, the Crayola project that we did was um, a really good use of of a, a technology we were developing, and they pushed us to do something that um, really came out quite well. Uh, they, we had, as I was, I was speaking earlier, the ability to let people uh, take what are normally our interactive gesture displays that interact as, as people move in front of them, um, which generally are, when they're running, they're, the content is there and, and people are interacting with what's already there, but that ability for us to deliver content to it from a mobile device, uh, they set up, um, I guess, four different screens. Each screen had a table of 10 iPads on them in front of them. Uh, they had their own Crayola drawing uh, uh, packages on those. Let kids or obviously anyone of any age come up, uh, draw whatever they wanted, uh, choose an effect, um, send it to the screen, be able to run up, interact with that, uh, you know, see your own creation, your own animation as, as what you're doing for your interactivity. Uh, and then there was reload stations, so if it wasn't a busy day, uh, kids could go up, type their name in, re resend what they'd created to the screen as often as they wanted and, and, and play. Uh, the response to that was incredible. Uh, you know, the, the kids absolutely loved it and uh, 
you know, it's a packed installation, always, always uh, uh, full of, of um, people really enjoying the, the fact that they could contribute to the experience. Very cool. Same question to you, Jim. What's the coolest thing you've seen lately using interactive? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, very specifically, I've seen a lot of things that are, uh, again, utilizing your, uh, your smartphone um, to either push content to the screen or change what the screen is doing or actually um, taking advantage of the accelerometer uh, within your, your smartphone to make things happen on the screen. Um, and so the example there would be that you, you know, wave your phone and in real time it's changing what's happening on the screen. Uh, those are some really cool things happening there. It's um, uh, driven by, uh, in some cases, local Wi-Fi, web sockets, all kinds of ways of getting those two devices perfectly synchronized with one another. Um, and um, I, I think that that and the idea of um, combining places, right? You know, when you deal with a Google Hangout or something like that, you're combining a bunch of people together and people see each other and everything else, but the idea of, of we're seeing some projects underway um, in the early development phases where they're saying we're going to have uh, people in one part of the country interacting with people in another part of the country through uh, within the same brand, obviously. Um, and I think we're, we want to see those really successful. I think those are going to be really kind of cool projects where if they really do it, it really comes together correctly in terms of, of um, you know, we're at one theme park and you're interacting with people in another theme park at the same time. It's just, can create a lot of fun, it can create a, a, a sense of a larger community um, that doesn't exist. So, uh, lots of different ways of doing that, but those are the things that are exciting me the most. Um, yeah. Um. I was going to say, unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of questions, so uh, kind of last call for questions here if anybody has anything burning that they'd uh, love us to touch on before we wrap up. So while we're waiting to see if we do get any last questions, I'll throw it to you guys each to give us kind of closing thoughts. Um, I'll start with you, Vincent. You know, just kind of a quick roundup of, you know, what we've talked about. What's the key takeaways that people attending that are thinking about interactive should go home and think a little bit more about so that they, they build the right experience? Yeah, I, I think it's um, about what type of experience are you trying to create and what's the environment you're creating it in. Uh, the, the size of the engagement, uh, the, the larger the engagement, obviously, the, the more uh, people who are able to experience it at once, uh, that's, you know, that can be a goal in and of itself, uh, but it also could be about uh, navigation of content and uh, you know each user being able to to navigate on their own uh, through the content dynamically you know, what what are you doing with that content to to engage them um, there's so many different technologies now coming together uh, to allow for uh, the digital science space to evolve uh, in terms of how people are engaged uh, I think Jim was just talking about the the sort of things he's seeing as the next next steps we need like far more engagement with mobile devices, uh, engagement of the the connectivity between uh, digital signage, uh, where people can meet each other really as part of a branded experience. Um, I think it's there's an endless amount of creativity. Um, the some of the the technologies that come to the market that move from a digital signage, which is a generally about engagement, but to connectivity and communication. Um, those are the, the other key factors. Uh, obviously, with people with mobile devices now having beacons in the displays um, where uh, not only are, are you sending, um, you know, like through Bluetooth uh, connectivity uh, information to the people who are around the digital signage, but you're adjusting uh, the digital signage to um, the demographics of the people who are in front of it. We're, we're doing that ourselves with, with Beacon Technology and our, some of our immersive gesture experiences and um, whether that's the, you know, through changes in, in what is being um, displayed in other frames with branding or just the actual content that people are interacting in, uh, the opportunities are, um, you know, enormous to get both the engagement and the connectivity and it's that aspect of, of uh, what can be delivered with a digital signage experience um, 
is becoming more and more important. The the location itself, finding out about who's there and how, you know, how they're interacting and and what they're experiencing, uh, and being able to communicate back to them um, is sort of the next steps in, in digital signage. I think. Great. Same question to you, Jim. Closing thoughts, kind of key roundups, takeaways for people that are uh, watching today. Yeah, I think as we're starting to see um, a much more uh, mass adoption of digital signage just across our lives, um, we're going to start to see projects of all types, you know, from uh, just static screens that communicate to us to ones that we can interact with. And um, uh, those will be of all budget sizes as well. Um, so there will be small and medium-sized businesses even having uh, looking to, to create interactive experiences. So it is exciting that it's becoming a larger part of our lives and um, that we're getting used to it. The factor that I always kind of come back to is we, we all carry a pretty powerful computer in our pocket. In some cases, we carry more than one. Um, we might have a, a small tablet with us and a smartphone or a laptop or whatever else. And so um, you know, we do need to kind of keep in mind that that is a device that uh, is a one-to-one -one experience that people already are interacting with. Um, and uh, are interacting with on a very regular basis. So we have a tendency to talk people out of, uh, attract clients out of doing certain things. Uh, we always say, you know, you don't need the weather on the screen because it's in your pocket. Um, you know, some certain things like that. Provide content and experiences that you can't get through your smartphone or in conjunction with it. And I think that if we follow those those simple guidelines, we can start to create a real good reason for why you would want to, to invest in interactive technology and content. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, unfortunately, I uh, don't have any other questions, but uh, I thought it was a really great conversation. I thank both of you for taking the time to share your, your knowledge and expertise with uh, everybody in the digital, excuse me, digital Signage Federation community. So again, thank you very much for your time. And for viewers out there, again, more information, future events at digitalsignagefederation.com. Check it out. Please uh, join in, participate, and uh, make your voice heard. Thanks, everyone.